<clears throat> Amen. All right, let's focus there in Daniel chapter number 10, verse number 21, where the Bible reads, But I will show thee that which is noted in the Scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. Now the word Scripture is used in the Bible 53 times total. But it only shows up one time in the Old Testament, and that's right here in verse number 21 when you see that phrase, that which is noted in the Scripture of truth. If you look at the word Scripture, the identifier, the root of the word would be script, referring to something that's written down, or something that the act of writing something down. Like if you look at the word manuscript, manu is referring to like a man doing it manual. It's not auto, the opposite of that would be manuscript, and then referring to a man writing it down himself. Now, when we use the word Scripture today, we don't just use it just in a general sense of referring to just something being written out. Specifically, we use it to refer to some sort of religious text. Now, if we hear it in our context, we think of the Bible automatically. But the word Scripture just really is a word now to identify any type of, you know, Islam, they refer to their Quran. At their holy book as as scripture. You know, obviously you could look at you know the Buddhists, the Hindus, all of them have what they would consider scripture. Now, there's only one true scripture. That's why when the Bible here in verse number 21, when it talks of, of itself, when the Bible speaks about itself, it calls it the scripture of truth. And that's the title of my sermon this morning, the scripture of truth. And if we're going to learn anything about scripture, where scripture came from, what Scripture is, what really is categorized according to the Bible of Scripture, we're going to learn it from Scripture itself. We're going to learn it from the Bible. And if you look at the, the men of this world today that consider themselves to be the scholars, you know, the experts on Scripture, they know nothing about Scripture. Yeah. What they really study, what they sit around and do is they read books about Scripture. And then they sit there and they study manuscripts. And they don't even study the manuscripts themselves as far as the words. They study the nature of the manuscripts. They do dating on the manuscripts. Scripts. They look at the stylized writing, the type of style of the writing. They look at you know the language. They try to reconstruct these dead languages, languages that they're not even close to speaking. And they know nothing about the Scripture. I say that to say this. If we're going to learn, like I said, anything about what Scripture is, where Scripture came from, we're going to learn that from the Scripture itself. And a person could say, well, just two seconds ago, you know, you used a dictionary, man's dictionary, to define the word Scripture. Turn to Isaiah chapter number 30, verse number 8. Isaiah chapter number 30, verse number 8. Now, you would have noticed here, if you, if you did it, and I'll read to you again. Daniel chapter 10, verse number 21, it tells you, but I will show you that which is noted in the Scripture of truth. So notice it uses the word noted. That's synonymous with the word write or written. And if you didn't understand that, look there in Isaiah chapter number 30, verse number 8. It says, Now go, write it before them in a table. Now watch this. And note it in a book. You need nothing outside of the Bible. Nothing. So if you didn't understand what the word Scripture meant, if you were to study the Bible, you could figure it out from the Bible itself. We need no other materials. We need no other resources outside of this book. So even if you wanted to study the Bible, where the Bible came from, what should be in the Bible, you're going to find your answer within the Bible itself. And people would look at that and say, you know, you're crazy. Do you know what type of person would say that? An unbeliever. Do you know what these scholars and these people that sit around studying the manuscripts are? Unbelievers. None of them, when you really break it down, none of them really believe the Bible. Right. None of them really believe the Bible. We're going to begin the sermon in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 15. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 15. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, begin reading in verse number 15. The Bible says, Paul writing to, to Timothy, his protege in the faith, he says, And that from a child... Thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So notice right here he says that they're holy scriptures. And the word holy just means set apart or sanctified. They're different than all other scriptures. All the other scriptures that all the other religions have out there, our scripture is different. Our scripture is set apart. Look at verse number 16 and see why. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now this is very important and I want you to notate this in your mind right now. Every time you see the word Scripture occur in your Bible, the Bible clearly tells you itself that all Scripture 
is given by inspiration of God. So remember that because we're going to refer back to that a couple of times. Keep your hand here though and turn to Job. What is it? Job chapter number 32 verse number 8. A lot of people have a strange idea of what the word inspire means or inspiration. The word, if you look at the word inspire again, just to break it down, you can see the word spirit in it. That's referring to breath. Over and over again, the word spirit in the Bible is referring to someone's breath or someone breathing. To inspire means to breathe in, just like respiration. So if you're at Job chapter number 32, look at verse number 8. Job chapter number 32, verse number 8, it says, But there is a spirit in man. Notice that. This is the only other time the word inspiration is used. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration, like the breathing in of the Almighty, giveth them understanding. Now turn over to Job chapter number 33, verse number 4. Job chapter number 33, verse number 4. <clears throat> Job chapter number 33, verse number 4, you'll see a similar statement. The Spirit of God hath made me, watch this, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. So we can see, we can see a comparison there, a parallel there, where when we saw when the Bible actually talks about how all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, Job says on one hand that it's the Spirit of God that gave him life. Then he says on the next hand that it was the breath of God. And he also uses inspiration there synonymous with the Spirit of God giving him life. So he's talking about the inspiration of God. So when the Bible talks about how all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, it wasn't just the thought of God that motivated them to write down certain things. That They were just encouraged by God to write down certain things. It's saying, turn to 1 Peter chapter number 1. It's saying that God's Spirit literally filled these men up. And when they spake, that it was God's breath that was speaking. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 1. You see the word Scripture used again here. 2 Peter chapter number 1. Let's begin reading in verse number 20. It says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Verse number 21, talking about Scripture in context. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we can see how Scripture came about, where it originated. Men, holy men of God that God had ordained, like Jeremiah, like the prophets of the Old Testament, were filled with the Holy Ghost, with the Spirit of God, right? And when they would speak, that was God speaking through them. Have you turned to another passage? Go to Jeremiah chapter number 36, verse number 16. Chapter number 36, verse number 16. So the very first step of us receiving Scripture was that it was prophesied. That it was first a word that was spoken. It, it didn't just originate as being written down. It was actually spoken first. <clears throat> and it was given by inspiration. It was they, When they spake those words, they were speaking God's words. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. God breathed the, the Scriptures, as many people would say. So you're in Jeremiah chapter number 36, verse number 16. Jeremiah chapter number 36, verse number 16. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 36, verse number 16. It says, Now it came to pass when they had heard all the words, they were afraid both one and other, and said unto Barak, We will surely tell the king of all these words. So they heard, they heard the words of God that was written down. Right? He was prophesying. Barak was reading the scriptures to them. Now watch what they say. Look there at the end again. We will surely tell the king of all these words. Verse 17. And they asked Barak, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? So he's actually asking. That's a very profound statement. And it's easy to read over if you don't really know what he's speaking about. He's asking, how did Scripture come about? How did you get the words of God written down? In a roundabout way, that is what he's asking right now. Look at verse number 18. Then Barak answered them, He pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. So that's exactly what we saw just a minute ago. How it says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And we can see other examples of this. We have, you know, Tertius at the end of Romans chapter 16 who says that he wrote this epistle. So Paul was the one speaking the words. 
Paul's the one that addresses the church in Romans chapter number 1. But Tertius at the end says, you know, says Tertius, I wrote this epistle. Tertius salutes you in the Lord. So who was the one that actually spoke the words? Paul as the human instrument, uh, instrument was the one speaking the words, being moved by the Holy Spirit. But Tertius was the one writing the words down. It's the exact same system that we see here with Jeremiah speaking the word. The word was first prophesied or spoken. It was a spoken word first. And then you have the man writing it down. The man of God writing it down. Turn over and look at Jeremiah chapter number 25 verse number 13. Uh, a, uh, an interesting comparison to what we just read here. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 25 verse number 13. This is God speaking. He says, And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it. Now, pronounced is being used in a different way here, but it's very similar. Look what it says again. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it. Remember, Jeremiah was the one that was pronouncing the words before as far as enunciating them. But look at the rest of it. Even all that is written in this book which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all nations. So that's very, very interesting if you compare it to what we just read, how in here God says that He pronounced these words. Over, over in, in Jeremiah 36 it said that Jeremiah pronounced the words and Barak written them down. Then God refers to the specific book that Barak read, wrote it in. And then God, after He says He pronounced the words, says Jeremiah hath prophesied against all nations. So we can see how God is the one speaking, pronouncing the words, how the Holy Spirit is filling up Jeremiah, but Jeremiah is also speaking the words. And then we can see that God writes the words in a book. So the first step is that the word is prophesied. That's the first step of how Scripture gets to us. Then we see that it's pinned down. Go to Exodus chapter number 17, verse number 14. We're going to look at some Scriptures of the, of the, of the Scripture being written down. Exodus chapter number 17, verse number 14. <clears throat> Exodus chapter number 17, verse number 14. <clears throat> it says in Exodus chapter number 17, verse number 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I, I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Turn over to Exodus chapter number 24, verse number 4. So we can see... The, we can actually see the commandment of even when he, he so he writes the story about the, the battle with Amalek. Then we can see the commandment of God given to Moses to write it in a book, and then we can read it in the book that he wrote it in. Look at Exodus chapter number twenty-four, verse number four. <coughs> Exodus chapter number twenty-four, verse number four. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning. Morning. Man, that sounded like I was from Kentucky, didn't it? Early in the morning, and built an altar under the hill, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Turn to Exodus chapter 34, verse number 27. Exodus chapter 34, verse number 27. Exodus chapter 34, verse number 27. <clears throat> And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. Numbers chapter 33, verse number 2. We're just going to look at a few more of these. Numbers chapter number 33, verse number 2. So we can repeatedly see where God commanded him to write these words in a book. And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So you can learn from this where God gives the commandment to Moses, hey, write this in a book. Not only are we... Because are we, we believe that, that, that the King James Bible, the Bible that we have today is preserved unto us and it's kept unto us perfectly in the condition that it was in at that time. So not only did Moses record the battle of Amalek that God told him to, he wrote down when God told him to write it down. When God gave him the commandment, hey, make sure you write this down, he even wrote that down. God wanted that to be written down too. God wants you to know that this was commanded by him to be pinned down in a book. So it was first prophesied, and then it was pinned down. Look at Numbers chapter number 33, verse number 2. Numbers chapter number 33, verse number 2. And Moses wrote their goings out according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their goings out. So notice it keeps recording that it's recording it. Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 31, verse number 9. 
We have three more to look at. Deuteronomy chapter number 31, verse number 9. So right here we keep seeing Moses repeatedly being commanded to write down that which God had, had given him, for, which would be Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter number 31, verse number 9. The Bible reads, And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, and, and which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. Look at verse number, I believe it's 22 in that same pat, this same chapter. Yeah, Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it the children of Israel. Now go over to Joshua chapter number 24. Joshua chapter number 24, verse number 26. Joshua chapter number 24, verse number 26. It says, And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And this is a pretty significant verse because notice the wording. It says, and Joshua wrote these words, and then it says this, in the law of God. Wrote these words in the book of the law of God. So you have the law of God, which repeatedly they always refer to as Moses being the author of the law of God. But then you also have this book here where that Joshua wrote. At the end of Joshua, where Joshua says that, that he is supposed... And Joshua wrote these words, it says, in the book of the law of God. So it's added unto the law of God. That's what the Bible says. So if people repeatedly tell you that the, that the law is made up of just the books of Moses, that's wrong. And you know who says it all the time? The Jews. Do you know what else they do? They deny the New Testament. Yeah. Isn't that kind of a coincidence? Right. So, so the law of God is not only the books of Moses... The law of God is also the book of Joshua. And if they're wrong about the Old Testament, why would you trust them when they deny the New Testament? Why would you believe anything that they say? Turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 10, verse number 25. 1 Samuel chapter number 10, verse number 25. You know who else says that are these so-called scholars? People like James White. They'll tell you that it's the Torah, right? It's just, it's just the book of Moses. That's not what the Bible says. If I'm going to learn anything about Scripture... I'm going to learn it from Scripture itself. The, I want the Bible to tell me about the Bible. You know, a person that would say, oh, that's ridiculous, is an unbeliever. It's a person that doesn't believe the Bible to begin with. I approach the Bible with faith. I believe the Bible. When I walk up to the Bible and I get ready to read the Bible, I believe, and you, I don't care if you think that's ridiculous or not, I believe every single word that this tells me. Amen. Right. Every word that is written in this book, that's what I believe. You think I'm ridiculous? I don't care. This one, that's what, these are the words that God spoke. These are the words that God prophesied, and God had them prophesied and then pinned down, and then they were also preserved unto us today. Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 10, verse number 25. 1 Samuel chapter number 10, verse number 25. <clears throat> then Samuel told the people the matter of the kingdom, watch this, and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Notice that, that phrase right there too. It says he wrote it in a book. And, lo and laid it up before the Lord. It says, And Samuel sent all the people, every, every man, to his house. Turn to 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 1. So we can see all these times in the Old Testament where the, what they wrote is actually recorded that they were writing it. That God wants you to know, hey, this was written. And it says there about, about Joshua that it was added unto the law of God. So we know that's a part of Scripture. 1 Samuel, it tells you very plainly that was added unto the law of God. We have tons of Scriptures in the New Testament, they're actually quoting the Old Testament. So, and, it'll, and Jesus himself will refer to them as Scripture. So you can prove Psalms is Scripture, Isaiah is Scripture, Malachi is Scripture, Zechariah is Scripture. It calls him a prophet. It says from Abel unto Zechariah. Just repeatedly, you can see all of these books, all of the books of the Old Testament. I didn't do this and map it out, but you can figure out that all of them are Scripture. You have David quoting Judges. I'll read to you from one other passage as well, from Luke. In the New Testament, because some people will say, you know, how, if you can prove what's Scripture of the Old Testament, how do you prove what's Scripture of the New Testament? You're there in 2 Peter 3. We'll look at that in just a minute. But I'm going to read to you quickly from Luke chapter 24, verse number 27. This is Jesus speak. It's talking about Jesus. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning himself. So notice the Scriptures beginning at Moses and all the prophets. In that same chapter, if you turn over to verse number 44, it says this, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses 
and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. So there, Jesus defines what Scripture for you. The law, which would also include uh, Judges, or Joshua, I'm sorry. And then he says the prophets, and then he also says the book of Psalms. Then you can conclude by all the other verses that are quoted from the New Testament, from the Old Testament, those also would be Scripture. They're referred to as Scripture repeatedly by Jesus Christ Himself. So that gives you a definition from Jesus' own mouth of what is considered Scripture. <clears throat> but the New Testament is actually referred to as Scripture as well. So look at 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 1. Whoops, 2 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 1. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter number 3. Verse number 1. I'm going to read to you real quickly, actually, from a couple other places. Stay there in 2 second, in second Peter chapter number 3, verse number 1. I forgot to paste these. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 19. The Bible says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And watch what it says. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. So when it says Jesus Christ Himself being the, the chief cornerstone, what is Jesus? He's the Word of God, right? So when it's talking about the foundation that's built, it's talking about the Word of God, and it refers to, notice, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So the prophets of the Old Testament, Moses was also referred to as a prophet. And then it says the apostles as well. Referring to that being scripture, referring to that being inspired by God. In that same chapter, Ephesians chapter number 3, or in that same book, Ephesians chapter number 3, verse number 5, further proof it says, which in other ages was, was, was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed, watch this, unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So notice that he's speaking, they're speaking by the Spirit, and it's revealed unto them, but to the holy apostles and prophets. Puts them again in the same category. We keep seeing them being brought up together. You're there in 2 Peter chapter number 3. Look at verse number 1. Peter writing. It says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds <clears throat> by way of remembrance. Verse number 2. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before of the holy prophets, watch this, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So notice in one breath, he puts both into the same category, just like Paul did in the book of Ephesians. He says that you would be mindful of, which were spoken, it says, before by the holy prophets, that's Old Testament referring to them, and of the commandment of us, the apostles, New Testament, of the Lord, of the Lord our Savior. Lord and Savior. Now look there, 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. Again, look at verse number, see if I can find it. I don't have it written down here, but I think I remember where it's at. Verse number 12. Again, notice what he says. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. So it's a very similar statement to what he made in 2 Peter 3 1. Always in remembrance of these things. Though ye know them and be, and be established in the present truth, yea, I think it mean as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. So notice he keeps making those same statements. Now I read that, and now I'm going to bring this to your remembrance. Just like Peter brought something to their remembrance. At the end of that same chapter is where he talks about prophecy and where he talks about scripture of what we read earlier. It says in verse number 20, knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So keep all of that in context. He's talking about putting you in remembrance in chapter 3, putting you in remembrance in chapter 1. We see how he puts the apostles and the prophets of the Old Testament in the same category. He calls the things that he speaks commandments, Peter does, then we see here in, in chapter number 1, in the same context of putting you in remembrance, he brings up the fact of the scriptures and holy men of God being moved by that. Not only that, like we saw, like we saw also in Ephesians, Paul put the apostles and the prophets, the, and he called them the holy apostles and the holy prophets, just like Peter did here in verse number 1 and 2. But if that isn't enough, look down at the end of the chapter. Look in verse number 15. It says, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So notice he says also there. 
I want to point that out to you, and we're going to keep reading, but notice he said that, that Paul also wrote, according to the wisdom that was given unto him, referring to wisdom also being given unto him, Peter himself. Look at verse number 16. <clears throat> As also in all his epistles, talking, saying, Peter saying that he is also writing an epistle. So Peter says, There's wisdom given unto me, and, and, and the same way that he wrote unto you, the same subjects that he wrote unto you about, I'm writing unto you about, and he wrote epistles to you, I'm writing epistles to you. Look at verse number 16. <clears throat> Speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, and then watch this, as they do also the other scriptures. So he point blank does two things here. He doesn't only refer to Paul's writings as scriptures, and he's also, I believe, yes, in context, because he was talking about in, in chapter number one, the Old Testament uh, scriptures, but I believe he's referring to his own writings right now as scriptures too. That's why he keeps saying also, also, also. He puts himself in that same category and keeps bringing up the fact that he's bringing them into remembrance the same way that the, that the prophets of the Old Testament did. Go to, uh, I'm going to have you turn it back to 2 Timothy chapter number 3 again. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Here's another passage where the apostles and the prophets are both put into the same category out of Jesus' own mouth. It says in Luke chapter number 11, verse number 49, Therefore also said the wisdom of God. So notice the wisdom being brought up again. I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. Now when God talks about sending someone in the Old Testament, like Jeremiah, He says that He sends prophets be times, saying early in the morning, rising up early and you would not, saying you wouldn't listen. That ended up being written down as Scripture in the Old Testament. And then we have him saying that he did the same thing with the apostles in the New Testament. So over and over again we see the prophets of the Old Testament being, being uh, compared and coupled with the apostles of the New Testament. We even see Paul's writings, sit, put your legs down. We even see Paul's writings being brought up and being referred to as scripture and Peter saying also in his, just in the same thing that I'm talking about in these things, he also talks about this in, in, uh, in his scriptures. Referring to his own writings as scriptures too. See this again in, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Look there at 2 Timothy chapter number 3. The same place where we're we were reading to begin with. Look at verse number... We'll get more context. Look at verse number 14. <clears throat> but continue thou in, in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. And then he says this. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, because of the next verse, that it's referring to his mother that taught him these things. Now, I, I obviously wouldn't disagree that his mother was the human instrument that taught him these things. You know, Unice is brought up in, in chapter number 1. His grandmother and his mother are brought up in chapter number 1. But look at verse number 15, what it says, and I'll explain to you my point. And it says in verse number 15, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So notice the statement. He says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And then he says this, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Saying you learn these things, right? And you've been assured of these things. And from a child you've learned these things. So that's not the same statement. Now I want you to keep your hand here and flip over to 2 Timothy chapter number 2 first. We'll look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2 verse number 1. He says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now watch this. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Look over at chapter number 1 again. <clears throat> See if I can find it. Chapter number 1, verse number 13. Watch what he says. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. So two times you have Paul saying in chapter 1 and chapter 2, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. Then he says in, in chapter 2, verse 2, and the things that thou hast heard of me... Then we get to chapter 3, and he says near the end of chapter 3, he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Referring to Paul himself. And then you know what he goes into right after that? And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. So what is Paul saying? 
He's saying the things that I write unto you. Like he says in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 14, he says, the things that I write unto you are the commandments of God. Turn to Acts chapter number 8, verse number 29. Acts chapter number 8, verse number 29. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 37. So he says the things that he's writing are the commandments of the Lord. Just like what Peter said in 2 Peter 3, that it was the commandments of the holy apostles and the prophets. <clears throat> Acts chapter number 8, verse number 29. Acts chapter number 8, verse number 29. Remember, we're studying the word Scripture. Remember what the, what the word... Every, every time we see the word Scripture, you know you can guarantee that it was given by inspiration of God. That it was the words that God spoke, right? Now, we saw that, that the Word of God was first prophesied. It, was the, it, was first, it first was spoken, or the, the holy men of God spake, it says. Then after that, we saw that it was wrote in a book, write it in a book repeatedly, noted in a book, right? So it was first prophesied, then it was penned down. <clears throat> look at Acts chapter number 8, look at verse number 29, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip. <clears throat> it says in verse number 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. And said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Now watch this. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some, of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So notice the word scripture was used two times. And it wasn't man referring to it as scripture. So this is a solid case. It is the Holy Spirit or God himself referring to what the Ethiopian eunuch had in his hand as Scripture. And what does the Bible say in 2 Timothy 3.16 again? That all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. <clears throat> so do you know what the Ethiopian eunuch had in his hand? He had not only the prophesied Word, and not only the penned Word of God, but he also had the preserved Word of God. He had the Scriptures in his hand. If what he had in his hand was just a copy of a copy of a copy, and it had been changed a hundred times... And it wasn't the Word of God. It wasn't the actual words that God spoke. Then, then the Bible is wrong here by calling this Scripture because 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now who in here is dumb enough to believe that what he had was the original copy? The autograph of it. Hundreds of years after the fact, like, like three, four hundred years after Isaiah, even longer than that, after Isaiah had preached those words. Not a chance. And there's a bunch of people, a bunch of independent Baptists who say, yeah, I believe you know, in the Word of God. I believe in a perfect Word of God in the original manuscripts. I believe in Scripture if it's the original manuscript. And something they've never seen in their entire life, they supposedly expect me to believe that they have faith in. What you do have in your hand today, you don't believe, but you expect me to believe that, that, that you trust in some manuscript that doesn't even exist on this planet today, that you don't even know what it says or reads, but you don't believe what you have today. The Bible point blank says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means that God breathed or God spoke those words. And right here the Bible refers to this as Scripture. Now, just, just, for, just to be sure, turn over. I want you to turn over to a passage real quick. We'll look at Luke chapter number 4. I don't have it in my notes, but I want to, I want to show you this real quick. Just in case a person were to be so stupid to say that, hey, maybe he, I, maybe he did have the original manuscript. Look at Luke chapter number 4. Luke chapter number 4, what Jesus reads. Look at Luke chapter number 4, verse number 17. And it was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Hey, now what was the Ethiopian eunuch reading? The book of Isaiah, right? 
the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord was upon, is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. It says, And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in, synagogue, in the synagogue were fastened on him. Now watch this. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Yeah, I know for a fact that it's not only the first copy of the manuscripts that was inspired by God, and that also God preserved the other words, and it was the exact words that God spoke, because the Ethiopian had one copy of Isaiah, and Jesus had another copy in the synagogue, and they're both, according to God's word, referred to as Scripture. Right. Both of them are called Scripture. And do you know what Scripture is? It's the actual words that God spake. Amen. God spoke those words. And you have all these stinking scholars out here. Like I said, they waste all their time looking at these manuscripts, and they say they come up with this stupid stuff, these bunch of infidel unbelievers... And then you look at the Bible, and it's just plain and simple. It tells you there's two copies, and guess what? They're both Scripture. And all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. <clears throat> Turn to uh, Job chapter number 19, verse number 23. You know what? That proves that God also preserved His Word. So number one, it was prophesied. It was, it was the spoken Word of God. Not only was it spoken, but God wrote it down for us. It's the pinned down Word of God. It was pinned down. It was prophesied. It was pinned down. But it was also preserved. Hundreds of years after the original book of Isaiah, there was copies of copies of copies, and it was still the inspired Word of God, even at that time. Look at Job chapter number 19, verse number 23. Job chapter number 19, verse number 23. Job says, All that my words were now written. Coincidence? All that they were printed in a book. Now watch this, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in rock. Watch this, forever. Turn to Psalms chapter number 12, verse number 6. Psalms chapter number 12, verse number 6. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 12, <clears throat> verse number 6. <clears throat> Psalms chapter number 12, verse number 6. I'm going to read to you from Joshua chapter number 8. <clears throat> Joshua chapter number 8, who was in the next generation after Moses. It says, and afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. So Joshua, the next generation, you can prove that he had all the words, because he read all the words, it says. Look at Psalms chapter number 6. Or, yeah, Psalms chapter number 12, verse number 6. It says, the words of the Lord are pure words. <clears throat> As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. And then he says this, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now, these people that, that, that you know, will reject the King James Bible as being the perfect preserved Word of God, they don't believe in a perfect preserved Word of God anywhere. It's not that hey, I reject the King James Bible of being the preserved Word of God. But I just believe that the ESV would be is the preserved word of God. That's not what they believe. And that would be dumb in the first place because the manuscripts that it's based upon were buried for you know, a, a century. They were buried for you know, like over, over you know, 1,500 years. They were, they were in the, like the 4th century. A very, very long time those manuscripts were gone. So that would be dumb for them to say anyways. Because not only is it preserved, to, it, will be pre, it will be preserved at the last generation, it says that it's preserved to every generation. It says from this generation, so what's being implied? From this generation to all generations, forever. But it's not only the ideas and it's not only the concepts, it's the words. And it's not only the words, it's the pure words. So it's not just the word and the idea of the word, because some people try to play semantics. Notice what it says in verse number 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. So you know what's preserved? The pure word. That means that there has to be a copy somewhere, a Bible that I can get on my hand, in my hand today, that is pure. I, sh I, I should be able to find some Bible somewhere that is the pure words of God and have that in my hand. Turn over to us. Uh, we're going to look at a few verses right here in the book of Psalms of just the preservation of God's Word. Look at Psalm chapter number 33, verse number 11. And I heard James White say one time, 
that he was in, and I think he was on like the, what's that guy's name on Wretched? Todd Friel? How do you, is that how you pronounce his name? Free. Yeah, Free, yeah. That guy, on, on, he was on his show and he was just like, of course, bashing the King James Bible because he hates the Bible. That's what it really is. It's not just, I, I don't even, I'm not even going to say he hates the King James Bible. He hates the Bible because this is the only true Bible. Right. He, he loves all these perversions, all these, you know, these, these modern translations of Satan's word, but he, and he hates God's word. And I heard him on there say that, yeah, people that believe in the preservation of God's Word in the sense that it's all words. He's like, Psalms 12 is the only verse that they have. Verse 6 and 7. And you know that, those, that in those other Bibles, it's actually changed. Yeah, right. It says that they'll keep them, the person referring to the person, not the words. And notice who is keeping the words. It says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt keep them forever. Uh, from this generation forever. Look at Psalm chapter 33, verse number 11. We're going to show that James White's a liar again. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. So what's the counsel of the Lord? That would be His Word. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. Watch this. The thoughts of His heart, referring to the Word, to all generations. Go to Psalms chapter 45, verse 7. And people, and people will say stupid things too. Like, see, it's just the thoughts behind the Word. That's why I don't want the words changing. Because a thought represents a word. If you change the word, it changes the thought. So that's a stupid argument in the first place. Look at Psalms chapter 45, verse number 17. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. How would David himself make God's name to be remembered forever and ever? To all generations. If he wrote this book and then God preserved it, it would. Go over to Psalms chapter 78, verse number 1. Psalms chapter number 78, verse number 1. Psalms chapter number 78, verse number 1. It says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He hath done. For He hath, he hath established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Watch what it says. That the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. Verse 7, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. Turn to Psalm chapter number 105. 100 verse 5. Psalms chapter number 100 verse 5. So notice over and over again, God's law is being brought up for, it's being brought up for all the children, all everyone's children to praise Him. It's being brought up that David... It's from David. He's going to be the source of that. He's going to be the cause of why all, all people praise His name unto generation to generation. That God's law will be given to generation to generation. Look here in Psalms chapter number 100, verse number 5. It says, For the Lord, for the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting. And then it says this, And His truth endureth to all generations. You know what it, Jesus said? Jesus said, sanctify them through thy, through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's right. So right here when it says, and his truth endureth to all generations, you know what Jesus said that that meant? He said that that meant that, his, that God's word would be given to all generations. Because that's what Jesus considered to be truth, was God's word. <clears throat> Go over to uh, just one page, Psalm 102, verse 18. Psalm 102, verse 18. Watch, watch this. You, you, a person can say, oh, that first verse you read was not talking about David's words himself. It's just the influence that David had. You know, something stupid like that. Look at Psalm 102, verse 18. This shall be written for the generation to come, watch this, and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. So who was it written for? The generation to come. And that'd be pretty weird to say that it's just for the, just the next generation were the ones that were able to have God's word at that time. Go to uh, Proverbs chapter 20, 25, verse number 1. Proverbs chapter number 25, verse number 1. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number 25, verse number 1. This ties in with the copy of a copy thing. Look at Proverbs chapter number 25, verse number 1. It says, you may have read over this and not even noticed it. 
These are also Proverbs of Solomon. Now watch what it says. Which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. So there was a time when the originals, very clearly, even at the time when Hezekiah was there, when the Proverbs of Solomon were when the, when the Proverbs of Solomon, the, the original copy, even I'm sure it wasn't even the original copy by the time it got to Hezekiah. <clears throat> Excuse me. But that was taken and set aside, and he says, This is the copy, this is a copy of that. Right. And I have no concern and no worry about that because God, man's not in charge of preserving God's word. God is. Yeah. David said, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation and forever. Now look over at Isaiah chapter number 30, verse number 8. We were here just earlier. We're going to read the entire verse. The verse in its entirety. Isaiah chapter number 30, verse number 8. Isaiah chapter number 30, verse number 8. <clears throat> The Bible says, Now go, write it before them in a table. This is God speaking. Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book. Now watch this. That it may be for the time to come forever and ever. James White is a fool to say that there's one verse in the Bible that teaches preservation. You know what that tells me? He's spending all his time reading books other than the Bible. Yeah, right. when the Bible we, can look at ver we can look at seven verses in the book of Psalms that talk about preservation. We can look at Isaiah. Here's another one in Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. And there's a lot that I left out. Like four other verses in Psalms. Isaiah chapter number 40, verse 8. <clears throat> look at Isaiah chapter number 40, verse 8. It says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth. And it says, But the word of our God shall stand forever. Go to, I'm going to turn to another passage. Go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 17. Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 17. Another verse in Isaiah, I can't remember where it is, but I can quote it to you. It says, God speaking to Isaiah, he says, The words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed. And then he says this, from henceforth and forever, saith the Lord. Over and over again. Forever. That's three verses in the book of Isaiah. Multiple verses in Psalms. Multiple verses you know, in the New Testament. <clears throat> and the average Christian does not believe any of what I just showed you about the preservation of God's Word. The average Christian does not believe you know, anything that I just showed you. But isn't it kind of funny that you have the New Testament apostles, prophets... You have the New Testament apostles. You have Jesus Christ Himself, God, in the flesh, walking on this earth. And you have tons of New Testament Scripture, but you can't show me one passage where the New Testament saints question the Word of God. Question the authenticity or the reliability of the Old Testament. One time, you, can't tell, you can't show me one Scripture where a single person you know, casts any sort of doubt on the preservation of God's Word in the New Testament. When, the, when a thousand years goes by. But then you have all these people today that just question the New Testament, question the Old Testament. On the contrary, you have Jesus saying that every word of God is what matters. Every single word. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now let's just, just, just for a second, let's pretend that Jesus thought that there was mistakes in the Old Testament. Would that, wouldn't that be complete stupidity for him to make a statement like that? To quote a verse that talks about every word? That wouldn't make any sense of all, at all if he thought that he didn't have... It doesn't matter how you look at that statement of what he made and why he chose to, to quote that specific verse from Deuteronomy. Here's the thing. It wouldn't make any sense at all for him to quote a verse about every word being important if he didn't believe that he had every word in his hands. That would make zero sense. So you know what that tells me? That God Himself, at the time that He walked this earth, believed that He could get a copy in His hand of every word, every inspired word of God in His hand. And I believe that you can do the same thing today in the King James Bible. Look at Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 17. Matthew chapter number 5. We'll look at a few verses in the New Testament about the preservation of God's Word. Matthew chapter number 5, verse, verse 17. It says, think not that I came, that think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I, I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. Look at verse 18. For, <clears throat> excuse me, for verily I say unto you, 
Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Go to Matthew chapter 24, verse number 35. So he said, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Matthew chapter number 24, verse number 35. Matthew chapter number 24, verse number 35. Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 23. 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 23. 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 23. This is actually a quotation from the Old Testament. It says in verse number 23 from Isaiah where we read in, in chapter 40, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God. Referring to the fact that it's pure. By the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. It says, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Can you imagine how dumb it would be for God himself to have the original writings, what's considered the autographs, to be inspired. But then immediately the next generation, everything is just corrupted. Everything is just impure. Everything is just, there's all kinds of mistakes. There's all, I mean, it would be dumb for God to do that. The, but the Bible repeatedly says that God's Word is preserved. Not only that would it be stupid, imagine this, just like we read here, that we're born again by the Word of God. Not only that, the gospel is preached unto us, right? It has to, you have to have the gospel, and people will refer to this verse, but the Word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the Word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Do you just need to hear the gospel? No. This is the Word which by the gospel is preached unto you. You have to have the Word of God preaching the gospel, or there's no power. There's no power at all. Imagine this. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, coming down to this earth, dying on the cross, and the only way that you can be saved is through His Word, the Gospel being preached, and then He just allows His Word to be destroyed. But He came down to this earth and He died on the cross, and that's the only way you can get to heaven. That's retarded. That's completely and absolutely ridiculous. And, and, and here's, here's the... the Turn to Acts chapter 18, verse number 28. This Here's what it all comes down to. Faith. Do you believe God's Word when you come to it? When you approach God's Word from the beginning, do you believe it? Acts chapter number 18, verse number 28. Acts chapter number 18, I'm sorry, verse number 28. Acts chapter number 18, verse number 28. Every word of God matters. Every single word. Every word is pure and every single word matters. And God, He first had, had His word prophesied. It, he, the holy men of God spake. But then He also had it pinned down. And it wasn't only pinned down, it was preserved. All of it. And God tells us within Scripture what, what books that are written that are, that are Scripture, that are written for us. The Bible clearly tells you when, when something is Scripture. It also tells you it will refer to other books in the Bible. But here's the thing. Let's say that there is a book that's not, that's not defined as Scripture. I believe it anyways. Because I believe this book by faith. And that's what it all comes down to. That's what everything comes down to. And it just proves when someone doesn't believe the, the verses about, doesn't believe that God preserved His Word, they don't believe God's Word because the Word itself is what tells them that it's preserved. So it just shows that they already, before they approached the Word, didn't believe it. Because if they did, they would believe the words that are written in it. Because that's all that they have to read today in the first place. They don't have manuscripts, you know, that the, the original manuscripts. They don't have the autographs to look at. And they'll tell you that themselves. So they can't prove to you without a shadow of a doubt that there are any errors. You know what it comes down to? As I said, they just don't believe God's Word. Now, if you believe that you have God's Word in your hand, don't you think you should study it? Don't you think you should know it? Like, you have, like, the Creator of the earth, the Creator of, of everything, the, He that gives eternal life, everlasting life. You know, His Word's powerful, His Word's majestic, the Bible says. If you have a copy, a perfect Word of God in your hands, don't you think you should spend time studying your Bible? If you have that attitude, you should. 
You should spend a lot of time. You should read your Bible daily. Look at Acts chapter number 18. Look what it says here. <clears throat> First look at Acts chapter number 18. Let's see, verse number... We'll start reading in verse 24 to get the context. It says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scripture, Scriptures, came to Ephesus. It says, This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much which he had believed through grace, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now I want to notice, I want, I want to point out to you, I want you to notice two things here. The, the description that's given of Apollos in verse number 24, it says this, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, it says, and then it says this, and mighty in the scriptures. Mighty in the scriptures. If I didn't have a Bible in my hand that was that was perfect, then you can't trust any of it. If I if I if any of it is unreliable, any of it, then all of it's unreliable. Because you can't prove what's right and what's wrong. If any of this is proven to be unreliable, then it's all unreliable. You can't trust any of it. I wouldn't spend my time reading it and studying it then. It would make zero sense, because then I don't know, you know, what's right and what's wrong. Apollos believed what he had was the Word of God. Now I know that. Because it says he was mighty in the Scriptures. He was great in the Scriptures. He knew the Bible well. Now, what sense would it make to, to waste your whole life studying a book that you're not even sure is right? But when you believe that it was prophesied by God, that it was the words of God were, were spoken, and then you see that the, over and over again, it's recorded by the Holy Spirit that those exact words were wrote down. And not only that, you have the promise of it also in the end being preserved. So it was prophesied, it was pinned down, and it was preserved. Why aren't you mighty in the Scriptures then? If you believe that God's Word is perfect and pure, and it's great, and there's nothing wrong with it, it's, it's, it's like silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times, and that God kept those words for you today, for you to study, and, and you can believe all of it, and you, have to, you don't have to question any of it, you have no problem with any of it, you know all of it's true, then we have no excuse to not be mighty in the Scriptures. We have no excuse. When you, have, when, you have, you can, when you can have faith in God's Word, and you can know that all of it's true, and all of it's perfect, and all of it's pure. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your, for your word, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you that, that you had it prophesied. It was the exact words that you wanted the men to speak. We thank you, dear Lord, that you led the process of them also pinning the words down. And we thank you, dear Lord, that you didn't just allow the manuscripts just to be lost and torn up and, and changed, dear God, but that you gave us promises in your word. And you didn't leave us even questioning. Even though you preserved it, you told us that you were going to preserve it so that we could have strong faith in your word, and that we could study and become a great Christian and become mighty in the scriptures. We ask you to open our understanding, bless the rest of the day, help us to learn much from your word, and help us also to apply it to our lives. Keep us safe, and we love you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.